Hi everyone, Brandon Jones here. I hope you are having a wonderful E3, or you did have a wonderful E3 2017. I'm a judge this year, which means I got to, and am currently, and will get to, play lots of fun games. But specifically, about a month ago, I, uh, here in Los Angeles, got to go uh, to the beach and play a bunch of fun games at a bunch of different types of events, and was not able to talk about them until specific embargoes uh, that were lifted over the last uh, couple, you know, days and weeks. And and instead of making a bunch of separate videos, I figured since I wasn't going to be as round as much during our live E3 2017 coverage, that I would specifically make uh, separate videos. I'm going to do a three-part series called Judge Jones, where I go through all of the games that I saw during the specific one-week period a month before E3. So these are a lot of publishers that decided to uh, specifically you know, isolate their games uh, on the calendar um, so they could get ahead of a lot of announcements, uh, get uh, their games in the heads of uh, journalists, but specifically judges, people that were going to be picking the best games of E3, uh, you know, out ahead of everybody else, because where we're at right now, I don't know what day it is, uh, you know, but uh, I'm recording this on the first day of E3, and so uh, there's a lot of stuff just happening now, and so it's very easy to get swept up in all the, all the carnage of all the announcements of E3. And so these are games that I've been sitting on, and I've been really excited to talk about, and I can finally talk about, and I'm going to do a three-part series, uh, so this is part one. Uh, if you uh, like hearing these takes on games here at E3, uh, then check look out uh, for uh, part two and part three. For part one, I'd like to talk about independent games. I'd like to talk about games that uh, you're probably not really thinking of right now. So uh, the way that this is going to work out in the schedule is you'll probably be seeing this video before uh, E3 even starts, before Tuesday morning, before the doors open, before we go in and go to all, uh, the, the, the bulk of our appointments uh, and, of course, play games on the show floor uh, and meet and hang out with everybody. Uh, and... So now all of the press conferences are going on, and you're probably thinking of all these big games, Ubisoft, Microsoft, uh, you know, Sony, Nintendo, uh, and so I'd like to give some of these independent games uh, a little bit of time uh, at the beginning of these Judge Jones segments. Uh, specifically, there is an evening called the Independent Evening. Uh, I was a judge, I was lucky to be a judge two years ago while I was uh, editor-in-chief over at Game Trailers, and uh, they also had the Independent Evening then, and uh, it was the first time I played uh, What Remains of Edith Finch, it's the first time I played Watam, I think it's called, Watam, W-A-T-T-A-M. Uh, it was the first time I got to play a lot of different stuff uh, that um, uh, didn't come out for, you know, months if years later. And so uh, it was really nice to, to get this opportunity. And basically what it is, it was at a bar and they have all of these TVs lined up and all of these amazing independent games in a lot of instances with the developers that made them. And so uh, if there were games that I was, was not necessarily wild about, it was really fun, you know, playing the game with the person who made it or with someone from the team and talk to them about anything you could possibly think of over a beer and some uh, wonderful hors d'oeuvres. Uh, but uh, I'm just going to go in no particular order through the list. Uh, some of these I, I spent a lot of time with and played directly. Some of these I kind of like glanced at over somebody's shoulder. Um, one of the ones that uh, I didn't really get a ton of time with was Full Metal Furies. Uh, and... Definitely got a Castle, cr Castle Crashers vibe from this. Uh, it's four-player multiplayer, and uh, you're just running around the map and, you know, blowing stuff up. What I thought was really interesting is there was a lot of uh, very aim-specific abilities uh, that were in use, which you don't necessarily see a lot with a... Not necessarily 2D because it's a big wide open battlefield that you're running up and down, but again, the kind of Castle Crashers north and south, but you're constantly going in one direction. Uh, and... Uh, as somebody, I think there was a sniper class, and as somebody who enjoys ranged stuff, who enjoys a good bow and arrow, a good sniper rifle, uh, no matter what the genre, no matter what the perspective, um, it looked like there was a lot of aiming of specific spells, so it wasn't just, you know, drop a crazy AoE where I'm standing, or uh, just run up and smack something, like, looks like there were a lot of different play styles, the classes were very specific, and uh, it's it felt very difficult. Uh, which uh, I appreciated, um, and uh, which it was kind of fun seeing some of the people there struggle uh, with getting through just the part that was there to demo. Uh, I played an absolutely fantastic VR game called Luna, and 
uh, one of the things, one of my big takeaways that we'll get into in some of the later episodes of Judge Jones uh, that I was really excited about with um, Judges Week this year was the Oculus. I hadn't had a, time, a lot of time to uh, mess around with the Oculus. Uh, we have a Vive here. Uh, I've, I've um, uh, checked out the PlayStation VR before, but the new Oculus headset is absolutely fantastic. And so uh, this was one of the first times I got to mess around with the, with the Oculus controller. And there's a lot of really subtle uh, selection and really subtle hand movement um, and uh, really subtle interaction with the world in Luna. What Luna is, uh, it's a very simple story. I don't want to you know, get into it too much because the creators could probably do a much better job explaining it than I could, but um, it's a very artistic game. Uh, it's a very uh, artful exploration into uh, very self-contained natural worlds with... Um, uh, you know, it's kind of like going through a storybook, and uh, there there was a narrative, but the narrative was kind of being fed to me at the time while I was playing, like things were being explained while I was experiencing them, and so I can't necessarily say if I would actually like, uh, or if I would actually um, be as perceptive and pick the little parts of the experience out uh, that, you know, were, were made clear to me while I was playing it, but uh, it was absolutely beautiful, and it was really neat uh, playing something that... Uh, there, there was not, it was, wasn't one of these games where I'm like selecting where I'm going to go and, and moving over to different environments. Everything was happening in front of me. I didn't have to walk around. I didn't have to, I just kind of had to look in and out uh, at uh, some of the, the things that were happening, but kind of felt like a media molecule game a little bit. There was, you know, uh, you, you could, you could move and place things at one point and change colors. And uh, it's unfortunate that I can't show you this game uh, because uh, it is definitely something that you uh, should check out in VR. Uh, I think it's one of those games that um, seems to kind of transcend a lot of the genres that are very popular in VR and a lot of the barriers that would prevent people from like jumping into VR. Um, I think it's a very simple game, uh, a very attractive game for you to just uh, kind of understand right away. There were a couple of people that were there at Judges Week that uh, do not necessarily like VR games. They really dug this game. So Luna, keep on the lookout for that. Uh, played Runner 3, which I'm assuming uh, is the third part in the Fantastic Runner series uh, that I am not very familiar with. Um, but I am now familiar with Runner 3 because uh, the wonderful developers of Runner 3 were there uh, to go through. Runner 3 is exactly what you would expect it to be. Runner 3 is an endless runner. You run a lot, you jump, you duck. Uh, but uh, it's, it's extremely bizarre. I think in the demo that I played like an eyeball came flying at me. Uh, and not just kind of like a silly cartoon eyeball, but like a real, you know, gross eyeball. And... It's just a very, I don't know, it was a, it was a very good attitude uh, at this, you know, bar situation because um, it was really fun to play a game uh, that required a lot of skill, that required a lot of concentration, not just concentration, but concentration over a long period of time. So you definitely had to focus on, um, you know, basically one wrong move and you would be taken out of this game. Um, and uh, it uh, that's basically it. It was extremely simple. But uh, what, I, what I appreciate in... Uh, uh, scenarios like this when you actually get to sit down and play the game with the developers is that was kind of the attitude that they had also like it seemed like they were really b making changes on the fly that they took a lot of the responses that were at the event uh, and those are going to directly go into changes that they make in the game it seemed like the build that I was playing was you know the build that they just happened to be working on at the time uh, and that changes you know drastically as they go throughout development um, because there's just all sorts of crazy things that you can throw in a game like that and there's a lot of the game there uh, it was skill based and so I played as far as I possibly could until um, I could not play anymore or until I gave up in shame. Uh, but there was more to be played, so uh, kudos to uh, Runner 3 in the condition that it was. Kingsway is an extremely unique RPG uh, that I'm curious for someone like Ben Moore or Ian Hank to play and stream. Kingsway is... Uh, kind of a Dragon Quest-y Final Fantasy looking uh, RPG. Uh, it is... Uh, simple in concept of design, but not simple in implementation. So just imagine like your old typical, uh, you know, uh, Amiga Apple II uh, RPG, you know, way back in the day, not a lot of colors, uh, but it's kind of almost as if you are playing this game on an old computer and you are the, the HUD of that computer is the, sorry, the operating system, the screen that you would use to use a computer, an old computer, is the HUD in the game. And so your inventory is a folder on that computer, and the game screen, the map of where you're moving is another screen, and, um, you know, different uh, 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 different status ailments and quest objectives and stuff like that pop up on other windows creatively. Um, but... It's, it kind of reminds me of the first time I played Minecraft, and I would, I would open up the uh, crafting window and just put weird things into it and try to see what happened. Uh, there's a lot of really fun experimentation, and it's a neat game to kind of jump into if you don't necessarily understand it right away, uh, because it's kind of fun to try to figure it out just by 
uh, practice and, and, and by messing around with it. Uh, and uh, the way they had it set up, they had a little uh, chair kind of at a restaurant, a little like, uh, you know, uh, chair with a little bench that you could sit at. And that's where you actually play the games. So you had to like walk in around one side and get comfortable. But they had a TV that was split around on the other side of the computer. And so you could just walk up and see people playing that. Uh, and that was really fun. That was just kind of mesmerizing to see a lot of different people, how they chose to uh, move around the HUD and how they chose to have windows at what size and in what uh, placement. I know that I could probably be very OCD about a game like that. Um, so that was extremely unique, and uh, I really dug that. Ooblets is a game that I think Kyle Bossman would like. I really liked it. Ooblets is like Pokemon meets Animal Crossing. It's basically, I always imagine like the developers were thinking like, how can we just get the cutest things in video games and just kind of all jam them together and make them cuter than they actually are. Uh, so there's the Pokemon element, you go into a world and you uh, capture little monsters and you use them to fight other little monsters to challenge other people. Uh, but you were also moving into a neighborhood. Uh, the, the demo began and uh, I got contacted by a friend, moved into town. That, that friend set me up with a house, uh, set me up with a little ooblet and, uh, you know, set me onto the world. And apparently you can like, uh, I was like growing things and I guess that's how you like grow ooblets. So when you fight other ooblets, you get seeds and then you plant those seeds and you can grow your own ooblets. Um, did a really, you know, uh, uh, rudimentary example of that. So I don't know how deep that goes. Uh, and the Animal Crossing element is you move into this town and there's people in the town I'm sure they're gonna have quests for you to do and I don't know if you can like upgrade your house or anything but uh, it was a very homey environment and there was a very clear ending uh, where uh, I got to uh, defeat a person on the path and the person was like, well, that's that's it for now. You can't really go ahead. Uh, the game had like a very clear wall that I couldn't get past. Uh, but it still let me roam around. And uh, again, the independent evening was a very, you know, free f uh, form evening. And so you could just kind of walk around and talk to whoever and play whatever. And so, you know, people were like clamoring for the ooblets machine. And so it was kind of fun to just go back and then again and walk around this world. Uh, and I enjoyed the aesthetic. Um, I enjoyed the animation. And I particularly enjoyed uh, the dialogue was funny, but the names are are, are really silly. The items that you can use and the type of ooblets that you can get uh, are all just completely adorable. I'm sorry that I don't have one example to give you right now, but uh, they're all kind of uh, disgustingly cute. And so uh, if you like disgustingly cute stuff, or you like Pokemon, or you like Animal Crossing, and you're curious to see how all that stuff goes together, uh, I recommend ooblets. Knights and Bikes. I didn't get a chance to play. I saw other people play. Um, looks kind of like an action uh, RPG puzzle game. Uh, kind of gave me a costume quest vibe um, in that uh, it seems like it's, you know, a couple of kids on an adventure in their neighborhood, uh, but there's lots of supernatural elements. Uh, apologies, I don't have more to report on there, but there were a lot of games at the Independent Evening. A Hat in Time uh, was a game that I also didn't play, but I uh, watched a demo, watched somebody else play uh, uh, the demo that they had there extensively. Hat in Time is a detective story, and uh, you are a girl that is on a train, and there's lots of anthropomorphic characters. Uh, there are some murders that take place, um, and you basically go room by room on this train and try to uh, acquire different items to help you get past, you know, in different puzzles and doorways, uh, and there's different abilities you can get. Uh, you know, some are time-related, some help you see different things, uh, and it's kind of just like an adorable little Metal Gear Solid. There's all these, like, little puzzles uh, to solve room by room, uh, and uh, the game is a really great kind of like Roger Rabbit wit to it, um, uh, kind of like a dark, uh, almost like a Tim Burton-y kind of vibe. It, again, it was something that I get, didn't get my hands on, so a lot of the, the platforming puzzle elements, I don't know if those are tricky or not, uh, but I loved the attitude of the game, uh, and uh, it was an, in a very cozy environment to check it out. Played Nidhogg 2, was terrible at Nidhogg 2. Uh, Nidhogg 2 looks like Nidhogg 1, but even better. Uh, I don't know if the aesthetic is weird to you. Uh, these little, like, you know, naked cavemen, Homer Simpson looking things running around and throwing, you know, smacking each other with, with swords. I didn't play, again, uh, uh, Nidhogg 1 a lot, and so I don't know how well uh, the gameplay and the aesthetic um, carries over, but basically the principles are the same, and they were. Um, uh, it, it was it was like an endurance test. It was definitely something that uh, you know we just kept going back and forth and back and forth, me and my opponent. And it was kind of the question of like, do I want to keep playing for pride, or you know, do I maybe want to go check out another game? Because I think we were playing you know like more than ten minutes at one point, just one match. Uh, and so that game can get pretty intensely competitive, uh, and uh, it is certainly unusual um, if you have not played Nidhogg one or two. Uh, if you get a chance at E3 to check that out, uh, Nidhogg two is very bizarre in a great way. Gorogoa. Gorogoa. 
is probably the weirdest game that I saw, probably the most captivating, I think maybe the most creative game that I saw at the Independent Evening. Gorgoa is four frames, maybe more later on in the game, I don't know. How you play the game is you move different frames of art around, and you can zoom in and out of those different pieces of art. And they basically represent a world, uh, a city, um, that uh, you can go into, you know, skylines and uh, you can go inside and out of paintings and stuff like that through, you know, in, in and out of doorways and windows and stuff. And the whole point is to find different places in each world and match them up with the other places. And that sounds simple, but when you... <laughs> it's crazy because it's like... I try to think of games like Metroidvania games. I try to think of, you know, games where I had to, like, remember maps and remember layers of maps and, and even things like Zelda games where there's, like, a dark world and a light world and, and you got to, like, remember both of these maps on top of each other at the same time. But it's like you have to remember all of these environments because there's so many different visual clues that it'll potentially throw at you. So if you're going into a room, if you'll just pick up a shape or, like, an image or something that is a painting now, but when you saw it before, it wasn't a painting. It was, you know, an actual, you know, tableau of, of real characters uh, uh, and your brain just kind of like naturally associates those things. Again, another game that was on display. I could see the people playing it on a big screen. And so it was fun to just kind of like check in on that game every 30 minutes and see a different people that were at different stages of the game and how quickly they were able to solve things. Uh, you know, how deep that rabbit hole went. And uh, uh, it was definitely... Uh, my wife likes puzzle games, and it was one of those things when I first saw it, I was like, oh man, I cannot wait to, you know, see Amanda get her hands on that, because, uh, that, that is a brain teaser. You basically have to remember four, you know, complete worlds to kind of put that whole game back together, so, uh, not a game I don't know if I'm going to be spending a lot of time with, because, uh, I'll feel very stupid. Uh, played Battle Chasers Night War, uh, which I know is a game is that Michael Huber was uh, curious about. Uh, one of the allies was uh, very kind enough in our community to send us uh, a comic of Battle Chasers, uh, which is what Night War is based on, uh, which is a, an old comic, I believe, uh, maybe started in the 90s around the turn of the century, uh, that I was not familiar with, but I really dug uh, Battle Chasers Night War. Battle Chasers Night War is a dungeon crawler turn-based uh, so you have an overworld uh, and you have, you know, top down, you know, characters that are walking through a dungeon. Um, and uh, I believe there were three characters in my party. Uh, there was, you know, uh, ranged brute and a uh, uh, healer. And uh, the demo was set up very well. It was very clear, like what I could do and what I couldn't do. Um, and uh, kind of reminded me of Darkest Dungeon in a way where you'd go into uh, villages and a little screen would pop up with a character art. And that character would tell you, you know, you could buy certain things and then you'd go into a dungeon or uh, encounter clearly marked uh, uh, you know, there's like a straight line going from one location to another location with a little like, uh, you know, kind of like Mario Party, little markers along the way. And then uh, potentially at each of those markers, you'd have an NPC that you could talk to or uh, an enemy that you would face. And love turn-based stuff, and uh, it was really satisfying, all the different attacks they, that they could do. Um, it wasn't, uh, you know, again, it was just a demo, so it really didn't get into, like, lots of crazy rules that they have set up. It was pretty straightforward if you understand turn-based stuff. Um, but uh, the I really dug, dug the aesthetic, um, and uh, that looked like a world that I might want to run through and uh, level up characters in. Uh, depending on how big, again, didn't uh, talk specifically with the devs a lot. Uh, not sure if those are the three characters that you're locked into, or you can go out in the world and, and meet other people. But... Um, uh, I dug that. That was an interesting looking game, and it played well. Uh, LX is an open world Mad Max style uh, swords and guns RPG, kind of oblivion, uh, but you can... Uh, uh, it looked like... Uh, I, I was just about to say you could go to third person. You can't go into third person in the Elder Scrolls games. I'm not a big fan of going to third person in those games. I like first person, but... Uh, uh, you can go to first person in LX, and... So yes, yeah, so you have this like open world... Mad Max type game uh, that has a fantasy fantasy aesthetic, uh, and it was extremely open world in that uh, during the demo there was lots of stuff to do. So when I was looking around at the different demo stations, uh, people were constantly uh, in other places doing other things, uh, killing random monsters or engaging in you know very story specific stuff. Um, it was an interesting game. It's tough to gauge open world games at E3. Uh, this was an open world game that, that jumped out and really spoke to me right away. Um, but uh, it was a little rough around the edges, uh, and it felt very heavy. Um, and uh, you know, when I play open world stuff that uh, requires like a little bit of platforming and finesse, I like to be a little more light on my feet. That might have just been the build that I had, and the armor I had, and the the weapons that I was using. Um, but um, not necessarily my favorite game from uh, E3 2017. But uh, again, open world game, and so I'm kind of curious to see how big that world is. And uh, as you know, we move uh, closer to launch, and more advertising is revealed for Alex. Uh, you know, seeing kind of the locations that we might go to, and uh, 
learning a little bit more about that game. Uh, that was surprised, always surprised to have somebody, you know, sit down and say, hey, play this open world game. And I'm like, an open world game I've never heard of before? Okay. Uh, so that was an interesting experience. Spells Force 3. Spell Force 3 is a game that I think Ben Moore would like a lot. Uh, kind of got uh, Pillars of Eternity um, vibes a little bit. Um, again, you know, don't play a lot of games like that. Uh, and uh, I don't know if I'll actually come around to, to, to playing Spell Force 3 when it comes out. But uh, top-down RPG, a lot of character, a lot of depth, obviously, to systems. The mission that I had to do was very simple. I just basically had to, like, cross a map. Kind of had RTS vibes. And I think what they were, you know, going for is, like, kind of a cross between something, you know, the, the familiar sense of, uh, you know, getting to know a battlefield and um, uh, getting to, to, you know, carefully position your troops, uh, be there, you know, like a well-formed army or just NPCs. Uh, and, you know, moving them, you know, as I had to in the mission, basically had to make sh make sure it was safe for a bunch of NPCs from, to get from one side of the map to the other. Um, and and there's a whole story surrounding that and interesting characters. You know, I had a dwarf and an elf in my party. It was it was very traditional fantasy. Um, and um, and I dug it. I don't have anything bad to say about Spell, Spell Force 3. I enjoyed Spell Force 3. Um, there is a lot of games like that that, uh, you know, are just giant, you know, 60, 80 hour, um, you know, PC specific point and click RPGs uh, that I, you know, do not spend a lot of time with. So maybe I am not the best authority on that, but um, I will check in with Mr. Uh, ben Moore, maybe Mr. Daniel Bloodworth. They seem more the type. Uh, and finally, MXM Master X Master is a NCSoft MOBA. This is actually the last event uh, right after Destiny that I checked out at Judges Week. And uh, one of the things I enjoyed, you know, everybody's got a MOBA, uh, but it is the NCSoft MOBA, and so there are a lot of NCSoft characters uh, that are in it, and uh, a lot of NCSoft games are uh, MMORPG-like, and so there's a, you know, big time commitment there, and so there's a lot of NCSoft games that I never got a chance to play, and uh, I, uh, you know, sat down and was like, oh, there's probably no characters that I'm familiar with. And I was like, well, I did play City of Heroes. And there's like, yeah, there's a City of Heroes uh, dungeon level. There's a City of Heroes, uh, you know, characters. You can play Statesman. And so uh, it was fun that like, oh, okay, even I, uh, you know, that does not have a lot of experience with uh, PC exclusive gaming. Um, uh, I, I can jump in here somewhere because, I ha you know, I have dabbled in uh, some NCSoft games. Uh, what was interesting, too, is is uh, you can pick two characters. So when you're running through uh, your MOBA screen, uh, that you have a, a swap that's on a cooldown, uh, and you can switch characters and utilize not only the character that you have, but, like, you know, a tag-in, basically, uh, and utilize their abilities, too. And so I thought that was interesting. That was fun to play around with. Uh, one of the things I enjoyed about MXM, uh, again, it was the last appointment that we had for Judges Week. Uh, they provided us with uh, some food and beverages, and so it was, you know, I, I I definitely did not mind just kind of kicking back and uh, playing the game a little bit and seeing all the different types of stuff I can do, trying out different characters and stuff. And what I dug was, even just at this event, there were a lot of different things that you could do uh, in that demo. And uh, for a game, I believe it's free to play, and for a game that uh, there's lots of different ways to earn the currencies that you need to use to buy more skins and try out other characters and uh, maybe like level up and you know experience more modes. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And so if you're just sitting down, and you're like, I just want to goof around this game for like 10 minutes. You can do that single player. Um, there are modes where you can just kind of run in and immediately beat stuff up, uh, or you can go into some of the more complex matches uh, that they said that they wanted to you know be quicker uh, and they want you to uh, basically have more of a range of you know, picking your exact amount of time and then doing an activity that fills that exact amount of time, um, which is interesting. And I know a lot of people are big NCSoft fans, so I don't know if that game was on your radar, uh, but that is the last game on my list for part one of Judge Jones. Uh, a lot of this was rambling. Uh, apologies, too, because it's a lot of games uh, to take in, and, um, you know, some outlets will send multiple people at Judges Week to different events, uh, based different appointments based on uh, stuff that they have more experience with. So, again, things like Spell Force 3 and uh, Knights and Bikes, uh, Hat in Time, uh, you know, Full Metal Furies uh, that I didn't necessarily get a lot of time to, you know, uh, you know, ex experience the breadth of the demo and talk to devs. Uh, but um, it was very fun to play games that you're not familiar with. A lot of the stuff that we'll talk about later on in Judge Jones, I was familiar with, and uh, I was like, oh yeah, I, I know about, uh, you know, Middle Earth Shadow of War, let's get into it. Um, and it's fun to pick up a controller for the first time and uh, have a person there that is uh, ready to answer questions about the game and jump into a crazy experience. Uh, and I absolutely loved almost all of these. And so uh, there it is, part one. Uh, part two, I'll get to some of the bigger games, and part three, uh, I will save for later in the week uh, because those are the very last a bit of embargoes in no particular order, but uh, stuff that they didn't want uh, people to find out about until later on in E3. So uh, three parts. Uh, that is part one. 
Thank you. Enjoy the rest of our coverage if you are currently watching the Easy Allies coverage of E3 2017. If not, thank you for hanging out and watching me talk about E3 games.